Well, what a joy it is to be here with you folks. I uh, call this place a miracle Amen. on the prairie. Yep. It is a miracle on the prairie. You know, I've been to many churches in the U.S., probably, I'd say a good 100 churches all over the U.S., 47, 40 different uh, U.S. states. And uh, I've seen some large churches in big cities. I've seen some small churches in small places. And this church is a miracle. It truly is what the Lord has done. And I'm so glad to be with you. Would you turn your Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 4? 21 years ago, I believe it was at a conference or either on deputation, where I sat with uh, Pastor Sullivan and I said, when I retire, and by the way, I'm not retiring. I'm just slowing down. When I retire, I said, we want to become members of Pemina Valley Baptist Church. And what a wonderful blessing it is to be here. And eventually we're going to become members, um, probably within a week or so. But anyway, since we arrived, so many people have helped us out. And we appreciate that. There are so many uh, uh, different individuals that have given, given us chairs. Our brother Friesen, he's, uh, he's loaned his vehicle to us. And uh, others have helped in other ways. We just appreciate this. And someone even baked us a pie. Love pies. Anyway, thank you so much again. And you know, even a glass of water given in Jesus' name will receive a reward. So the Lord knows what you have done. I appreciate that. You know, because of your prayers and your financial help, in the six years we've been in Toronto, four Jewish people have trusted the Lord. Amen. And it's difficult. It's not an easy, you know, it's, in fact, it's one of the most difficult ministries I can even comprehend about or, or think about is trying to win a Jew to Christ. From babies, they've been taught that Jesus is a, is a false Messiah. He has never been the Messiah. And, uh, and if you believe in him, you'll become Meshumad, which means you'll be cursed forever if you believe in him. And can, can you imagine from a child teaching, uh, teaching a child from that age? No wonder they don't want to come to know the Lord. But any anyway, one, uh, Alicia, she followed the Lord in believer's baptism. And hopefully the other ones will too soon. We appreciate that, your prayers. In the six years, we have distributed over 200,000 Bible tracts in the Toronto area. We have mailed our tracts across Canada to every synagogue, every rabbi. We could uh, obtain their names, uh, 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 their names about and um, at three different times, we've mailed all our tracts to every synagogue and rabbi in the U.S. twice already. And we just have New York to do. 2,600 rabbis have received our Bible tracts. And who knows what the Lord may do in their hearts. So thank the Lord. So thank you so much again for your prayers. We appreciate that. Well, I have one last request. Would you pray for us? We rented a U-Haul back in August. And it was a 26-foot truck. The day before we, we were uh, supposed to load the vehicle, we had hired two men to load the vehicle. You haul call and say, I'm sorry, we can only give you a 20-foot vehicle. What am I going to do? We could never get all the furnishings on a 20-foot vehicle. So we had to hire a mover, and he said, okay, within two weeks, he says, your, your uh, furnishings will be here. Well, it's two weeks. Now it's going to be the end of the month. And he said, it only costs so much money, and now it's almost doubled. So would you pray for that? You know, the message, Sonny and I really spoke to my heart. All things work together for good. Not some things or a few things, but all things work together for good. So the Lord knows that. So do pray about that as well. Let's begin reading in verse, if you would, verse 1. Exodus, verse 1. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? I underline the word hand. And he said, A rod. And he, and he said, cast it on the ground, and he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, put forth thine hand, underline that again. Take it by the tail, and he put forth his hand, underline that again, and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand, I underline that hand again, into thy bosom. And he put his hand again, underline that, in his bosom. When he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into the bosom again, and plucked it up of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as other flesh. After reading this text, I noticed something very interesting. It has to do with the hand. Just look at your hands for a moment. Well, I see skin, I see nails, I see wrinkles, brown spots. That's age, of course. What do we do with our hands? Well, we eat with them. 
We wash with them. We caress with them. We hug with them. We type with them. We cook with them. We work with them. Did you know that there are 29 major and minor bones in your hand? 123 ligaments in your hand? 34 muscles that move the fingers and the thumb? 48 nerves, 30 arteries in your hand. Now we can have a long discussion about the coordination of the hand, about the creation of the hand, the strength of the hand, the skill of the hand. But there's something far greater about the hand that God wants you and I to know about. What's interesting about this text is God didn't say, Moses, how's your voice? Can you speak? Are you a good, great orator? How's your voice? He didn't ask that. He didn't ask, he didn't ask how are your feet? Can you run? Can you walk? Do you need a cane? Do you need crutches? No, no. He didn't ask him about his feet. How about your eyes? Do you need glasses? Do you need lenses? No, he didn't ask him that as well. How about your ears? Can you hear? Do you need hearing aids? No, he didn't ask him as well. But he did ask him, what is in your hand? In fact, notice verse 2 again. And the Lord said unto him, what is that in thine hand? And he said, a rod. I want to preach a simple message. What's in your hand? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful day and thank you for this great place. We, Lord, we just thank you for the great work that you've done in this community and the precious souls that were saved. Many years ago, Lord, we were here 20 some, 25 years ago and there was just a little building here and now there's a great building here built by the hands of these precious people. And Lord, we thank you for the impact they've made on this community and the many precious souls that have been saved. And I pray that many more would come to know Christ as their Savior. Do thank you for Pastor Sullivan, Mrs. Sullivan. Continue to be with them. Watch over them. Protect them. Protect the folks in this church as well, Lord. We commit it to thee. I pray you use a simple message to glorify the Lord Jesus, dear Holy Spirit, and enable me to bring this message with clarity, with sincerity, in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. You know, as I meditate on this passage, I ask myself the question, why did God ask Moses, what is in your hand? It's interesting that the word feet occurs 256 times in the Bible. The word eyes occurs 501 times in the Bible. The word mouth occurs 421 t 424 times in the Bible. The word ears occurs 271 times in the Bible. But the word hand and hands occurs 1,929 times in the Bible. There's something about the hand that God wants you and I to know. And by the way, I also have a hand, a finger missing. And let me encourage you, can I just digress for a moment? Young man, let me encourage you to live for Jesus. As a young boy, at 12 years old, I got saved. I met a wrong group of teenagers about the age of 14, 15. And I'll tell you, I paid a price. God spanked me. At the age of 21, I lost an eye playing football. God was spanking me, trying to get hold of my attention. Let me encourage you to live for Christ, young people. At the age of 29, I tore a finger off in construction. Two strikes. At the age of 35, my wife didn't... I became an alcoholic. I was abusive. She tried to end her own life. She was unconscious for four days. And God got a hold of my attention. She got saved not long after. January 5th, 1978, I came back to the Lord. So let me encourage you, young people, live for Christ. Because if you don't, God chastens his children because he loves us. So having said that, notice verse 2 again, if you would. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. We're all familiar with Moses, how God spared his life, how his mother made an ark, placed him in the ark. Pharaoh, he wanted to kill all the babies, all the male babies, you know. So placed him in the ark. And of course, uh, placed him in the river of Nile. His sister Mary was watching little Moses. And all of a sudden, Pharaoh's daughter came. She came to bathe. And there she is. She heard a little baby cry. I'm sure there was an angel that just pinched him or something. He began to cry. I don't know. Maybe it's not true, but anyway. And she felt compassion. She took the baby. And of course, Mary was there. And she says, listen, I know someone who can take care of the baby. Moses' mother got paid to raise her son. Amen? I find that so amazing how God works out the major and minor details in our life to accomplish his will. At the age of 40, we know what happened. Moses killed an Egyptian, hit him in the sand. Pharaoh is furious. He wants this man killed. He runs for his life. He fled for his life for 40 years. He attended Desert Bible College, watching sheep to pay his tuition. You see, the first 40 years, he learned how to be somebody in Pharaoh's coat. The next 40 years, he learned how to be nobody. And may I say, the last 40 years, Moses learned that God was everybody. Amen. Now, chapter 3, turn to chapter 3, if you will. Notice verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1. 
Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Now he's watching sheep around Horeb, which is Mount Sinai as well. Suddenly he sees a bush on fire. In fact, notice verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in the flame of fire of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. He's quite inquisitive, you know. Why is this bush burning, you know? I mean, this is so unusual. It's not being consumed. So he goes a little closer. Suddenly the Lord calls Moses out of this bush. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside, to see God called him unto him out of the midst of the bush. And he says, Moses, Moses. By the way, that's the law of double mention. Whenever God says something twice, he wants to get a hold of your attention. Three times. Bill, Bill, Bill. Well, thank the Lord for his mercy. Otherwise, my wife could be in hell if she would have died. Thank the Lord, he spared me. She got saved. Thank the Lord for that. Now, in the ensuing dialogue, the Lord tells Moses he wants him to leave the children of Israel. In fact, Notice we would in verse 10. Verse 10. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses makes his excuse of inability. Notice what he says in verse 11. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Have you ever felt like that? Who am I? He said, I'm just a sheep herder. I'm just watching sheep. What do I know about leading, you know, uh, taking these people, you know, uh, out of Egypt? Have you ever felt like that? May I remind you of some verses that the devil tries to, that I use when the devil tries to stop me from doing God's work. For example, going to Toronto. Many times I've gone to Toronto with fear. I really have. I mean, there are shootings, there are stabbings, and some Jewish people, in fact, I received a call from a man. He says, if you come into this area again, he says, I will kill you and I'll urinate on your grave. I called him back. He didn't answer the phone, but I left a message. I said, I'll see you tomorrow. You see, they try to intimidate you, cause fear in your heart. And the devil does that. You know, you can't do anything for the Lord. Here's a verse I always use, Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Not some things or a few things, but I can do all things. Here's another one. John 15, 5. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Here it is. For without me, you can do nothing. We can't do anything without the Lord Jesus, amen. But with him, we can do all things, amen. Then he makes the excuse of incredulity. Chapter 4, verse 1. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. Well, notice God's retort in verse 2, chapter 4. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. You know, folks, that rod brought fork, a frogs forth. Frogs were in the food, the kneading troughs. They were in the beds. Can you imagine opening your sheets, your pillow, and there's a frog on top of your pillow, opening the blankets, there's frogs there in your food, in your, you know. That rod brought forth water. It brought forth blood, lice, became a serpent. It defeated the Amalekites. When you take the, stu take the time to study what God did in the hands of certain individuals, it is simply amazing. For example, Joshua, what's in your hand? He says, only a spear. Joshua 8, 18, and the Lord said unto Joshua, stretch out the spear that is in thine hand toward Ai, for I will give it into thine hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear that he had in his hand toward the city, and the ambush arose quickly out of their place, and they ran as soon as he had stretched out his hand, and they entered the city and took it. With that spear, he defeated the city of Ai. Shamgar, what's in your hand? He says, an ox gourd. Judges 3.31, and after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew the Philistines, 600 men with an ox goad, and he delivered Israel. He killed 600 men with an ox goad, delivered Israel. David, what's in your hand? 1 Samuel 17, 49, 50. And David put his hand in his bag, took the fence of stone, slang it, and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he said, oh, I've got such a headache. Anyway, the giant said that, and he fell upon his face to the earth, so David prevailed it over the Philistines with a sling and a stone, and smote the Philistines. With that stone and sling, David killed a monster of a man, nine foot six inches tall. Little boy, what's in your hand? He said, just five loaves and two little fishes. Listen to Andrew, Peter's brother. John 6, 9. There's a lad here which hath five barley loaves, two small fishes, but what are they among so many? With those five loaves and two little fishes, they fed 5,000 men plus women and children. That tells about 20,000 people ate. 
And I'm sure maybe when it was all over, 12 baskets left over, maybe one of the disciples took a basket. Here, Sonny, hey, you take that home for giving us your five loaves. He came home with a basket. His mother said, Abraham, where'd you get the basket of loaves from? Well, mommy, you won't believe it, but there was a man. He, 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 went, he prayed. He asked God to bless the, the food. He gave it to the disciples. They distributed it, and they fed thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Abraham, I told you not to lie. Wait till your dad comes home. You're going to get something from your father if you lie again. Abraham, where did you get that food from? Mommy, I'm telling this man named Jesus. He multiplied this fish and these loaves. What's in your hand, poor widow? Only two mites. Luke 21. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting into thither two mites. And he said, of a truth, I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all, for all these have their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God. But she of penury hath cast in all the living that she had. Jesus said, this poor widow gave more than all they gave. And by the way, the offering box was like this, and it was like a shape, like a trumpet. And these rich men, Pharisees, Sadducees, they'd come, they'd pour their money in there. Can you just hear the silver just hitting the bottom? Clink, clink, all this noise, you know. And they were just clapping and just rejoicing. They gave so much money. This little widow put two little mites in. Clink, clink. Jesus says, she gave more than all of they, they gave. Let's bring this a closer home. Let me ask you, dear Christian, what's in your hand? May it never be a dirty magazine, amen? May it never be a carnal DVD. May it never be a deck of cards. May it never be a bottle of beer or wine or liquor. Amen. Like I got involved. Yeah. Almost destroyed me and my family. Never be a keyboard or a cell phone that looks for filthiness on the internet. Can you see what the hand can be used for? It can be used for the glory of God, for the goodness of others, and sadly for grievous sins. Would you turn to the book of Acts now? Acts chapter 3, if you would, please. Acts chapter 3. Acts 3, begin reading in verse, oops, verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of the prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain lame man from his mother's room was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him, but John said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none. Oh, hey, he was a Baptist preacher. He said, silver and gold have I none. But such as I give thee, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And he took them by the right hand and lifted them up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. This is a wonderful story, great truth that will help us all to understand the matter of the hand that God desires for you and I to use it for his glory. Peter's going to the temple with John. They approach the gate to enter the, to enter the temple, and they see a lame man. In fact, notice verse 2 again. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb. Consider the length of time that he was crippled. It says from his mother's womb. He never ever walked crippled from his mother's womb. But consider the love of those who carried him every day, whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them to enter into the temple. Every day, two or more men, care of this man, so he could go to this gate, beautiful gate, to ask of Psalms. Take a moment and just think for a moment what these men had to go through. They had to get a canvas or whatever it was, some, something to carry this man for a distance. And then when he was finished begging, they had to carry him home again. I think that is simply love so amazing. But there's a great principle here that I don't want you to miss. This man needed someone to help him, to get him to this gate. So Peter and John, they approach this man. He's probably begging, alms for the poor, alms for the poor. But Peter says in verse 4, he says, look on me, look on us. This man's eyes are probably lit up. He's expecting great blessing, some money. But Peter says in verse 6, silver and gold have I none, but such as I give thee in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And he took them by the right hand. What can we use our hands for? We can use our hands for the goodness of others. Make a list of people. Some may be elderly. Some may have health issues. Take them shopping. Use your hands to encourage them. Galatians 6.10. As we have therefore opportunity, let's do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. 
James 1.27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself in spot from the world. I witnessed to this woman, Irene, she's a Holocaust survivor in her 90s. I witnessed her many times. I prayed for her a dozen times. I visited her. I used to take her bagels every so often because she had no one. I said, Irene, call me. I'll take you shopping, whatever you need. Folks, when I still pastored Bible Way Baptist Church, I made a point of visiting elderly people in their care homes just to encourage them, just, just to say, hi, how are you doing? To pray with them. Do you have any needs? Can I pray about your needs? Can, can I help you in some way? Folks, use your hands for the goodness of others. Would you turn to the book of John? No. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, notice verse 35. Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, looking upon Jesus, he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. You know, the way our world is going, I'm looking for the coming of the Lord any day. Behold the Lamb of God. He's coming soon, folks. And if you're not saved, make that decision tonight to trust in Christ as you see. You don't want to be left behind to go through the great tribulation. And looking upon Jesus, he walked, he says, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following. He saith unto them, What seek ye? They said to Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and said to them, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. What did Andrew do after he got saved? He first brought Simon, his brother, to the Lord Jesus. Folks, we can use our hands for the goodness of others. We can use our hands to give out the gospel. Whether it be a tract or a Bible, as I said, in the six years of Jewish ministry, we've distributed over 200,000 uh, uh, tracts, 130 Old Testament and New Testament Bibles. Folks, we're only touching the surface of getting the gospel out to Jewish people and to others as well. Think about this. Today, the world's population is 7.8 billion people, and most are lost without Christ. 159,000 people die every day without Christ. 6,000 every hour, 164 every minute, and most die without Christ. I wonder how many folks this past day or this past week, how many tracts you handed out to some lost soul or talked to them about the Lord Jesus, how to be saved. What can we use our hands for? We can use our hands to give out the gospel. Would you turn to the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and I trust that Pemina Valley Baptist Church will always be a gospel preaching church and a church that wins souls, and I know it will, amen. Verse 1, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the church of Macedonia. How then, in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and not to us by the will of God. Insomuch that we desire Titus, that he is begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and all diligence, and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. You see, we can use our hands for the goodness of others. We can use our hands to give out the gospel. And thirdly, we can use our hands for the grace of giving. These verses speak of the grace of giving. Paul is telling the church in Corinth how the church in Macedonia, they're going through a great trial, extreme time of poverty. And may I say, there are missionaries right now who are struggling, think about that, to meet their needs. Do you know why? Because too many believers have their hands on their wallets so tightly and no one can open, not even the Lord sometimes. How sad. From this text, there's some, tre some tremendous truths that will challenge every one of our hearts. How these people in Macedonia gave because of the grace of giving. Consider the reason for their giving. 1 Corinthians 16, 1, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given the order to the church of Galatia, even so do ye. Paul is encouraging people in Corinth. He said, I want you to give. There's a famine in Jerusalem. The rain didn't come. Crops couldn't grow. Food was at a premium. 
So the church of Macedonia, they helped the church of Jerusalem by taking an offering. But notice the ruination that the Macedonians went through. In fact, notice verse 2 again. How that in the great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty. Apparently, at one time, Macedonia province had been known for their wealth. But because they were believers, Rome persecuted them. I mean, these people lost their jobs. They lost their businesses. Lost, you know, and no one would hire them. They were living in deep poverty. But notice their response in helping the church in Jerusalem. Notice verses 3 and 4 again. For to their power, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift, take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. How did they give? They gave in a deep poverty. They gave without pressure. They were willing of themselves. Paul didn't put any pressure on them. They just wanted to give. They gave beyond their power. What does this mean? It, mean, it really means that they gave until it hurt. I would like to think, Maybe a little poor widow stood up and says, you know, I've been saving for that little dress, that nice dress I saw in, in that window there in that shop, and I like them. But you know what? I'll just patch up my old dress, and I'm just going to give that money that I saved. I'm going to give it to help those people out. Maybe someone else says, instead of fine flour for bread, we're going to use barley flour, you know, to make bread. Maybe someone else says, you know, these old sandals, I think I can just duct tape them up, and I can still continue to use them. As I mentioned before in Mark 12, we read... And Jesus stood over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money to the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow. She threw in two mites, which make a farthing. This poor widow had two mites all of her living. That is sacrificial giving. Just like the Macedonians. She gave until it hurt. And then these people gave because of a principle. Notice verse 5. And this they did not as we hoped, first gave their own selves to the Lord and not us by the will of God. I find that interesting. When you give yourself completely to the Lord and wholeheartedly to the Lord, then giving will never be a promise. Trust me. But I find here something so touching. They gave with pleasure. In fact, notice verse 2. How they had a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy. I can always imagine this church in my mind, you know, praise the Lord. <laughs> this is so wonderful. We're giving with joy, with gladness. Praise the Lord. We can help these people. But we don't have too much, but we're just giving. They were hilarious, giving out of their hearts. The saints in Macedonia were giving with joy. How sad that some believers give because they have to, because the preacher preaches on tithing, faith, promise, mission. Others give to peace or conscience. And some give for recognition. In the Jewish area, I laugh sometimes. I see all these buildings, you know. The Cohen Hospital, a Cohen uh, something other building, uh, uh, Sam Lila, another building. You know, they want their names. They want recognition, some of these Jewish people. But these precious people, they give with joy. They didn't want any recognition. Dear Christian, what's in your hand? Are you using it for the goodness of others? Are you using it to, get the, to give the gospel out? Are you using for the grace of giving? Let's pray.